And the biggest tension, uh, of course, was between this, what word do you use? Do you use well-being? Do you use happiness? Do you use quality of life? Do you use life satisfaction? And so forth. And one of the things that becomes clear is that a lot of people in academia and in the policy world really don't like the term happiness. They get kind of, you know, it freaks them out. They just can't handle it. And a lot of people in, out there who are not in that world, who are just sort of ordinary citizens, actually find terms like uh, well-being to be aloof and, and kind of off-putting and, and uh, uh, academic and wonky. That's probably the, the best word for it. So they like happiness. And so, uh, but this was a tension we were having. We were having another tension uh, over, you know, is this a personal thing or a political thing? What's more important, personal change or policy change? And Enrico Giovannini, who until recently was the Minister of Labor and Social Issues for the Government of Italy, uh, and is just an absolutely remarkable individual. I think that you're going to hear him in Brussels, in Brussels soon. And, uh, uh, anyway, uh, Enrico, we were out and he, he took a stick and he drew this diagram, not quite so perfectly, but he drew this diagram uh, in the sand in front of a tent uh, in Bhutan, and he said, folks, this is what I think we're about. I think we have to go beyond our all these little disputes and silos and look at the big picture. And this is essentially the big picture. So this is what I think is useful to think about and sometimes talk about uh, with people. Everything, everything has to happen within planetary boundaries. This is something that a lot of economists don't understand that there actually are limits to growth. You cannot go everywhere. And the goal, what we were really talking about when we talk about happiness is equitable and sustainable well-being and happiness. That's the terms that Bhutan uses. And all of these things are important. Uh, Gifford Pinchot, who was the first director of the United States Forest Service, defined this as the greatest good for the greatest number over the longest run. The greatest good being well-being or happiness, uh, the greatest number being that it's equitable, that it's spread out so everyone has a chance, and the longest run meaning that it's sustainable over time, that we don't use all the resources making people happy today, uh, and that we understand these limits to growth. So Giovannini said that if we understand well-being as these aspects of the domains, and I think you've probably talked about the domains and everything, mm -hmm. uh, which Laura measures with the survey, which Bhutan measures, and so forth. If you talk about well-being, you're looking at measurements along these domains, which you, ha which you can have objective data for. I mean, some of that may come from surveys asking people certain questions, but essentially it's things like, for health, life expectancy for material well-being, what is the poverty rate, what is the number of people who, the homelessness rate, uh, things of that sort. You can measure it this way. Now, uh, happiness on the other hand could be defined as subjective well-being for the wonks who want to do it that way, Giovannini said, but it's really how we feel about aspects of our life. So our life expectancy may be good, but if we feel that our health is poor, then we're not particularly uh, necessarily happy. And that's what the, the survey gets, this, these uh, subjective surveys measure, and the Gallup World Survey and the World Values Survey and all those things, they, they measure this life satisfaction. So the development paradigm is basically the economy and the institutions of the society, which may be all the, the non-government institutions, the agencies, the government institutions, the market, Whatever combination it is that makes up, in a sense, the productive forces of society uses what we call forms of capital, and you're probably familiar with that term, uh, uses those in order to meet human needs. And we can look at human needs along Maslow's theory or Maxineef or all of these things. There's too much to get into now. What are the forms of capital? Well, they are the, the ones we most commonly think of as capital are built and financial capital. These are the 
you know, the factories and the things that produce stuff, the money that makes it possible. But what we s ignore and what the whole field of ecological economics has brought forth is that there are three other key capitals. Human capital, which is basically, as individuals, how much, uh, what about us can make us contribute more to well-being in the society? Are we well-educated? Are we healthy? Uh, do, you know, and, and so forth. And there's social capital. What are the connections, the things that bring us together in organizations? So we know where social capital is low and people are disconnected and isolated, uh, well-being is also lower. So, uh, and then finally there is, and we cannot ignore it again, with the planetary boundaries, there is natural capital. All the, the gifts, what we think of as nature's gifts or benefits, the stuff that that we get, that, that we often overlook, and that if you want, you can put a dollar value to, and ecological economics does that. Now, I must say that within the, the happiness movement in Bhutan, we had some disputes over this. There are certain people who get as nervous about the word capital as other people get about the word happiness. And some people think that using the term ha ha capital is old paradigm thinking. You're just reinforcing the words of uh, the system. To some extent, there may be some truth to that. On the other hand, there's also a great usefulness to this, because we are talking to people who think of capitals and assets and things as something that you have to invest in, that you have to steward, that you have to take care of, and all of these things. And you can get that message across. So what we concluded as a team in Bhutan is that you may use different terms, capital, assets, <coughs> capabilities, resources. There are different terms you can use, and you might use them with different audiences. But it is isn't not useful to sacrifice a strategic asset, which the term human capital or social capital or uh, natural capital is for us when particularly we're talking with the business or policy community. So here's the results. We have a development paradigm which uses capital to meet needs, and then we can measure the outcomes through objective ways. Uh, that is well-being, and that is the prime purpose of policy. Policy is essential for giving us a floor, a minimum, a base of well-being that we can measure in that way. But you can have well-being and not have happiness. And we can see this in many cases, since I'm a time balance freak the one thing that I thought about is leisure time. Now we know that the United States objectively has terrible time balance. We work long hours, we have no vacations, we have no family leave, we have no sick leave, we have none of these things guaranteed by law that all the European countries have. So we work longer hours objectively than people in these countries. If that changed, if we had laws and we changed that, we could see an increase in well-being as measured by uh, objective things, working hours, amount of free time, all of that. But if people spent all of that time, which some people say they might do, watching television, the likelihood is that they would not be happier. The likelihood is they would be more exposed to anxiety producing things, to things telling them that the good life is about consuming more and more encouraging them, in fact, to work more and more, even though they don't have to, in order to get the stuff. Yes? Two minutes. Two minutes, yeah, I'm, getting, I'm winding down. So the, uh, <laughs> so the, uh, the, the thing is here, though, if from happiness data, we know that if those same people were to spend that time uh, volunteering in their communities, working in their gardens, walking out in nature, socializing and connecting with their friends in the cafes, taking care of each other, doing those things with that free time, they would indeed, in all likelihood, be happier in this. So what it is, is that telling, having people understand the purpose, in a way, of education and of personal change and personal behavior, having people understand, get out. Don't spend that time watching TV. Connect with other people. Socializing is a happiness skill. Volunteering is a happiness skill, as are all these things we've talked about, gratitude, tolerance, uh, altruism, and so forth. And you can take for each one of these domains from Bhutan 
you can look at what are the happiness skills that help translate good results in well-being into good results in societal happiness. I think this is just a, a model. It's not perfect. You can always find issues and problems with it. But for me, uh, when, when Enrico did this, and for those of us in our group in Bhutan, it was an aha moment. Mm -hmm. ah, this makes it simpler to understand and to communicate. Thanks. Mm -hmm.